Hello, and welcome to show number 2414 of Eyes on Success, a weekly program covering a wide variety of topics of interest to people with vision loss. I'm Nancy Goodman Torpy. And I'm Pete Torpy. Well, in recognition of the upcoming eclipse across North America in a few days, we're bringing you an encore episode about astronomy. Astronomy is often thought of as being based on visual observations. As it turns out, most raw astronomical observations aren't visible to anybody and must be transformed in order to be perceived by humans. We'll talk with Morgan Renberg, a blind astronomer, about these issues in relation to those who are vision impaired and how he's able to do his job. But first for our tip of the week. This week's tip comes from Morgan Renberg. I was wondering, based on your experience, with all of a sudden finding out in the middle of graduate school that your eyesight had taken a turn for the worse and realizing that you had to make some accommodations, if you had advice for other people in that position, how to plan for it, how to deal with the change, it has to be tough to deal with a transition like that. It is difficult. I think the first thing I would say is to not panic. And I think that's a hard thing to do and something that I probably didn't do very successfully. But if you're going to go through a transition like I did, uh, one good thing to know is that it happens relatively slowly. Uh, And that might mean months. That might mean years. For some people, that might mean decades. Uh, And that means that you don't have to figure out everything all at once. I made one little accommodation on day one and then another accommodation probably on day 20 and another one on day 50. And, you know, like one day, maybe all I would do is sort of get up the courage to turn up the font size on my phone. And that was that. And then, you know, a couple months would pass by and I would manage to do the same thing on my browser and then manage to make things bigger on the computer. And it didn't all have to happen at once. And I think that that's something that maybe I wish that I had known a little bit more right off the bat and maybe would have made me feel a little bit better about the things that I was and wasn't doing uh, as they played out. You know, I think that's great advice. Sometimes people can be overwhelmed with the amount of changes they anticipate that they might have to make. And if you think you have to do this all at once, it's just horrible to think about, but it's a lot easier to break down the problem into small, manageable bits one at a time until you have each piece of the puzzle under control at a time. And it sounds like that's what you did. Right. Uh, You know, honestly, there's nothing that I could do when I was diagnosed that I don't do now, with the exception of of driving. And probably I shouldn't have been driving when I was diagnosed. Uh, So having gone from uh, best corrected of 2070 to 2200. I'm able to do all the same things. I've bought progressively larger TVs over that time scale. But I'm, I'm last night I was watching a football game. Uh, I go out and do all the same stuff I was doing before, and I, I still worry that you know one day I'm going to wake up and the uh, switch is going to flip, and things will be a, a lot different and things will have to start changing. But As a physicist, I have to sort of remember that the past is a pretty good predictor of the future. And so I imagine that as things change going forward, I'll find new ways to adapt and I'll be able to come to you in a few years and say, well, I'm still doing all the same things uh, that I was doing when this journey started. Eyes on Success is supported by... Table One, a portable Braille keyboard for any smartphone or tablet for typing and navigation that has been used by thousands of blind people. You don't even need to know Braille to use it. More information is at www.imhable.com. That's I-A-M-H-A-B-L-E dot com. You are listening to Eyes on Success. Success, 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 success. Let's start by meeting Morgan. 
Hey, I'm Dr. Morgan Renberg, and among many other things, I'm the Director of Scientific Presentation at the Fort Worth Museum of Science and History, uh, where I think about how we communicate science to the public. I understand you started developing some visual issues as a graduate student. We'll talk a little bit more about that later, but can you briefly describe what your vision issues are? Sure. I have uh, Stargardt's disease, which is an inherited form of macular degeneration. And I was first diagnosed about a semester into graduate school, which would be, I guess, six years ago now. Um, so at that point, my vision was something like maybe 2070. And today, it's more like 2200. So you've had to make the transition to no longer being able to drive a car. Right. I gave up driving the day I was diagnosed. And uh, honestly, one of the best inventions uh, of the last decade, uh, as I'm sure many people in my situation know, are things like Uber and Lyft, which have really given me the freedom to do the things that I would do with a car uh, without uh, having to own one. And so thankfully, it hasn't made a big impact on my life, but uh, I used to like road tripping and that's definitely something that uh, that I miss these days. You know, it's interesting. So I was born with congenital glaucoma in the 50s, which I didn't realize could happen in kids at the time. And I had approximately that kind of vision between 2200 and 2400 vision until I went to graduate school, at which time my eyes deteriorated. But, you know, with that kind of vision, really you can do most things with minor accommodations, it seems, except for things that adults would like to do, like drive. You hit the nail on the head. Really, I think I live a life that isn't that different than the life I would live if I had kept all my vision. Uh, but that's only because of the incredible technology that has sort of come out in the last decade or so. And I'm very excited to think about what that might look like a decade from now for people who are just starting on a similar path. Nonetheless, there are parts of being an astronomer that are made difficult by having low vision. And in the rest of this show, we'll learn how Morgan is able to overcome some of those challenges. Support for Eyes on Success comes from our listeners and corporate sponsors. For more information about airing promotional items on the show, send an email to hosts at eyesonsuccess.net. This week's focus topic is what Morgan does as an astronomer and what accommodations he's made to enable him to pursue that career path. So you describe your title and what you're doing these days, but can you tell us in a little bit more detail what exactly your function is these days and what you're doing? Uh, so my job at the Fort Worth Museum of Science and History is to look at what we have within the organization and how we can best use those resources uh, to communicate science to the public. So what artifacts do we have? What facilities do we have? What people do we have? Uh, and then what are the important science messages that the public should be engaging with today? And what's the right way to tell those messages with the stuff that we have? So I understand you're also involved in creating planetarium shows, which I assume are just as popular in Fort Worth as they are everywhere else. But I assume that you personally can't see the stars as they're being displayed. How does that work for you? So for the most part, I can still see many of the stars. And actually, sort of, if we can design something that I can appreciate, that usually turns out to be a pretty good design because it also means that it's visible to a five-year-old who maybe isn't paying that close attention or an 85-year-old who maybe is just dealing with the effects of aging eyes. But most planetarium shows these days actually aren't just showing the stars. They're more like surround movies. Uh, for example, we have one in our planetarium right now that what we worked on last year that basically travels the solar system and we visit all of the planets in the solar system to learn more about them. And so it's not just, you know, labeling Jupiter as a dot moving across the sky. It's actually flying to Jupiter and seeing the photographs returned by NASA missions, uh, but also hearing a live presenter tell us about those 
uh, worlds and tell stories about the sky and the planets in ways that I hope were just as engaging uh, if you couldn't see anything at all and were just listening to the stories of the way we uh, have learned about the sky in the past as well as the incredible things and ways we're learning about the sky uh, and the planets in the solar system today. Can you tell us a little bit about how you initially got interested in science and your genesis to become a student of science? So I think I have to trace that one back to my father, who was a biology professor. And so I grew up sort of imbued in the world of, of science and sort of interrogating the world. And uh, when I was growing up and you know, it was a Tuesday afternoon, my mother would take me and my sisters to the park and we would you know, pick up rocks and look at them, check out streams, uh, climb trees, just get out there in nature and then come back in the evening and talk about that with my father who would you know, I'm sure ask questions about what we saw and what we thought that that meant and sort of put me in the direction of, of thinking about the way the natural world worked. And I think I probably pretty much my whole life wanted to be a scientist and it was of secondary importance what that science actually was. I had a, had a really great chemistry teacher when I was in high school and I had developed a real love for chemistry. But then somewhere along the way, that interest for chemistry got uh, diverted to an interest in physics, and that interest in physics eventually put me on the path uh, to astronomy and planetary science, uh, which is basically a combination of astronomy and geology. Uh, and so I'd like to think that at one point or another, I have been at least briefly infatuated with almost all of the sciences. And that's set me up really well for the job that I have now, which spans all the disciplines and uh, really thinks about science in a broad, broad perspective. You have to know a little bit about everything in your position. I think that's one of the interesting aspects of majoring in physics and probably why I majored in physics. I couldn't decide whether I was more interested in electronics or mechanics or chemistry and physics sort of covered a little bit of everything. And to me, it wasn't so important as to what particular area you were going to study, but just that they're all interesting. A problem is a problem, and they're all puzzles and new understandings to be found. Right. It was pretty much the same for me. Yeah, not to rah-rah on physics too hard, but I think one of the things that I always found most satisfying about physics was that even today— Physicists, even at the graduate level, are trained as generalists. You know a little bit about all the branches of, uh, of physics. So as an astronomer uh, with an intention to study the planets, I learned about the quantum mechanics of how molecules uh, emit packets of light. And I learned about the thermodynamics of how heat in stars transforms them uh, and a little bit about everything. Yeah, so you're actually in an interesting position because although you're fairly early in your career, you're in a general position. And Pete and I each started out in pretty specific assignments, but even though we stayed at the same company throughout our entire careers and we were research physicists the whole time at the same company, our assignments kept changing. And pretty significantly as we went from one sub-branch of physics to another. Yeah. You know, I made the decision at the end of graduate school to sort of leave the world of research behind and enter the world of, of science communication. Well, it has to be pretty exciting to be able to be in a position where you can excite young people about science and why it's important, and even impart that message to adults, even if they're not interested in becoming scientists. You know, not everyone needs to be a scientist, but, you know, to impart that realization that it really is important and it has some big impacts in major parts of our lives. Yeah, I just personally get so excited thinking about it that even if I never shared that excitement with somebody else, just the opportunity to sort of learn and think and get excited about it myself would be reward enough. But then the chance to share that wonder with many, many other people uh, just really offers me the opportunity to feel like I'm 
connecting other people with one of the most amazing feats uh, of humanity. Uh, And that's a really satisfying opportunity to have. I gather that even well before you got your job at the museum, that you found other outlets through which you could communicate not only your excitement for science, but also some of the scientific information. When I realized partway into graduate school that maybe I was enjoying thinking about and talking about science more than I was actually doing the research, I realized that I would need to develop skills in those areas if I ever wanted to get a job outside of academia doing it. Now, you couldn't go and get a research job at a company if you'd never done any research, and I didn't expect to be able to get a job talking about science if I had no experience in doing it. So I started looking around and trying to figure out all the different things that uh, I could be doing. And so I started a blog, I started a podcast. Uh, Eventually, I joined up and started hosting a YouTube show. I've been doing writing behind the scenes for programs like SciShow. And and now I've actually started uh, experimenting with editing in science programs as well. So each little Opportunity has taught me something new about ways to effectively communicate science with the broader world, Uh, but they've also all just been a lot of fun to learn and experiment. And one of the things that I'm most satisfied by now that I'm a year or two years out of grad school is that I feel like I'm still learning and exploring uh, as much as I was when I was a student. I'm just focusing it on things that are a little bit different now. Well, and that can certainly make a career f- fun. We always felt at Xerox that we were always learning and venturing into new areas. And, you know, that can be very exciting. I think it's key to feel that way uh, if something you're, you plan to, to do for a long time, because otherwise just going to work can be quite the chore and nobody likes doing their chores. Isn't that the truth? And in many careers, learning can and should be a lifelong experience, even after you retire. If you keep learning, you can keep your interest in life and new things. There's plenty to learn about out there, and plenty of interesting issues and problems to figure out more about. In fact, one of the unintended side benefits of doing this podcast every week for the last eight years is that Pete and I have both learned a lot about audio editing. So apparently, even with your vision problems, you've learned to accommodate using a lot of the built-in accessibility of commercial products. But I would guess there were still some difficulties in accessing scientific information, using some of the tools that you needed in your work. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think improving the quality of accessibility in scientific tools is one of the biggest remaining challenges that we have to, to really make science a field that is open to uh, to people with vision disabilities. And I can really only speak here from my uh, personal experience uh, working with tools in astronomy and planetary science. Uh, but one of the common threads across science tools is that they're created by scientists. You know, they're not created by professional programmers. And they're often sort of put together to solve a single problem uh, using a particular programming language that might be ideal for solving that particular problem, uh, but isn't ideal for offering um, sort of accessible views to that data. And so, you know, the modern programming tools provided by companies like Apple and Microsoft and Google really make it easy to create interfaces that, you know, can be read by a screen reader or that have scalable text um, or can have the colors changed on their images, for example. Those kinds of easy tools don't exist for people trying to make scientific software. How do you think the accessibility of scientific tools, or lack thereof, has impacted your work? So I wrote a lot of code when I was doing my research uh, in graduate school. Uh, Code to analyze images, code to download data, code to make graphs, code uh, to write papers, all sorts of things. Not a single bit of that code that I wrote uh, was accessible, not even to myself, because 
tools weren't really there to make that possible. So I would often write some lines of code uh, in a text editor that had nice big text that I could read and uh, easily work with. Then I would run that code and I would have to zoom in on the screen to see the result uh, because the sort of default text output that would come out of that would be very small, uh, very compact, invisible to a screen reader, buried inside of a computer terminal or something like that. And there wasn't really a clear way for me to address that problem. And then the tools that I would use, for example, I would download data uh, off of servers from NASA. I worked on NASA's Cassini mission studying Saturn. And so often I would go on and download new images or new data from the Cassini spacecraft. And the interface to do that could have like a hundred buttons on it. And every button would toggle some little parameter and there would be 50 text fields to fill out uh, saying, oh, what exposure do you want? What time of day do you want? What angle of the sun do you want? So on and so on. So that you could drill down from the millions of images that Cassini captured to the specific ones that you were looking for. And although I never tried to use a screen reader on those sites, my suspicion is that they're probably not very friendly. And I'm sure that they're especially not very friendly for anyone, sighted or not, uh, who is trying to access them from a mobile device. And if the next billion people to get online and get involved with science are going to be accessing them from mobile devices, and if science wants to be the inclusive, welcoming environment that I think it needs to be, uh, then we've got to find ways to create those tools in a way that's accessible to a wider swath of the population. And I don't think there's an easy answer to that, uh, but I think we have to recognize the problem first and think about how we might go about solving that problem. You know, as you point out, there are some difficulties, particularly if you have some vision or access issues with these programs and applications. But we've often seen that if programs and tools like that are well designed for people who need the access features, they're often easier to use by other people who are sighted and the larger community. I mean, sometimes, for example, you know, some of the examples you gave there really seems to me involves too much clutter around. And if there's too much clutter around, too much information, too many buttons people have to press in order to get the information they want, it makes it hard for everybody. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I think I had plenty of sighted colleagues when I was working as a researcher who struggled almost as much as I did to sort of make sense of the interface that they were working with. Um, but as a researcher, the temptation was very strong to just do the very most minimal amount of work necessary to get something up and functioning so that you could move on with the research part of the project. And you can understand that. The scientists don't want to work on the interface. They want to work on the physics. Yeah, we weren't paid to be, to be software developers. We were paid to be astronomers or physicists. And we wanted to get to that part as fast as possible. But the end result was sort of decades of tools built one on top of another in which everybody had felt that way. And the end result was something that was very difficult for anyone to use, but especially people who might have a little extra difficulty. Well, and then on top of it, a lot of the commercial tools, whether it's for signal processing or laying out a integrated circuit, they have all sorts of just plain visual glitz because they're trying to make it commercially successful. And so they did spend a lot of time on the interface and that didn't help the people with visual impairments either. Absolutely. And really, you know, no one's immune to to this. I think the, the tech companies have done an admirable job of considering accessibility in a lot of their designs. But I just updated my Google Chrome and it's like 90 percent white now. And that makes things harder than it needs to be. And I, I think that it must look cleaner to to the designers. But they took a tool that is really just a portal to the actual tools, the rest of the Internet, and made it, at least for me, just that tiny little bit harder to use that uh, makes me want to switch to a different browser. I guess the bottom line is, if you have a visual impairment and you want to be an astronomer, there are certainly some challenges that you'll need to overcome. But you know, many professions come with some sort of challenge in one way or another, and there are usually ways of overcoming those challenges if you have the motivation and the desire to succeed and 
do what you want to do. You are listening to Eyes on Success. Success, 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 success. Now for this week's final item, how to connect with Morgan Renberg and how to see some of his work. So if people would like to contact you or find some of your work on the web, where would you send them? Uh, You can check out my personal website. That's morganrenberg.com or M-O-R-G-A-N-R-E-H-N-B-E-R-G.com. Uh, The podcast that I co-host is called The Weekly Space Hangout. We'll be coming back for our next season in just a couple of weeks. Uh, And you can find that as a podcast on Apple Podcasts or Google Play. Uh, But we shoot it primarily as a YouTube show. Uh, So you can check us out over at youtube.com slash weekly space hangout. And if people have particular questions for you, can they contact you from that web page? Yes, there's a form on that web page that you can fill out and I hope it's accessible. Honestly, I'm not someone who uses a screen reader every day, so I haven't checked, but I will go and check after this. And you can fill out contact information and I will be more than happy to get in touch with you based on that. And do you have a social media presence? In theory, uh, you can follow me at Morgan Renberg, same spelling as the website on Twitter. And I I used to post a lot. I post relatively little these days, uh, but that's my primary social media presence. And if people wanted to see some of the work you're doing at the Fort Worth Museum of Science and History, I assume they've got a web presence that they can look at? Absolutely. That's fwmuseum.org. And if you're in the Dallas-Fort Worth metropolitan area, please come on by. If you let me know that you're coming by, I'd be happy to come out and say hello. And we, I always love to hear what, what people think. In the time since we first aired this episode, Morgan has actually gotten himself a new job and is now working at the Adventure Science Center in Nashville, Tennessee, as director of exhibits and the planetarium. And their website is www.adventuresci.org. And you can find all of that information by clicking on the link to the show notes for this episode, which is 2414. That's it for today's show. Next week on Eyes on Success, we'll be talking about the Envision glasses and the Envision AI app, both of which feature real-time text recognition, voice controls, and hands-free video calling to people who are blind or have low vision, enabling them to access everyday visual information for themselves. We'll talk with Karthik Kanan founder and CTO of Envision, about the glasses and the free-to-use Envision AI app. So enjoy the eclipse, and if you're looking at it, make sure you wear the right protective eyewear. You've been listening to Eyes on Success, hosted and produced by Nancy goodman Torpy and Peter Torpy. You can access the full archive of previous shows, subscribe to the podcast, and much more by going to our website, www.eyesonsuccess.net. If you have questions about anything you've heard on the show or have suggestions for future shows, send an email to hosts at eyesonsuccess.net. Thank you for listening and have a nice day.